Well, good morning. Welcome to Grace Community Church. I'm Pastor Brooks. I'll be bringing you the word this morning. What you just saw there was kind of a compilation video of a series that we finished about two weeks ago called Momentum. That was a six-week sermon series which focused on one specific aspect of discipleship, which is the aspect of, uh, of stewardship, recognizing that God has a mission and we're to be uh, his stewards, to steward our time, our talent, and our, our resources that we might help advance that, that mission, which is to be and to make disciples of, of all nations. And there's a secondary goal in, in our Momentum series, which is a two-year stewardship follow-up. And we talked about uh, a goal that we'd like to reach, uh, $6.8 million. That's two years worth of a budget. And we had Commitment Sunday, as you saw, which was on the video. That was um, uh, October 20th. 28th, where individuals and families decided, here's what I'm going to commit for the next couple years in terms of their personal giving. And they made that commitment on October 28th. Now, some of them were not there. Some of them have made that commitment last week. Some of them, you're just coming back. And so you can continue to do that. We're going to do have a celebration Sunday next week. We're going to take a look at what uh, what what God has provided through the generosity of his people, you, and we're going to see how close we are to that goal and, and just celebrate whatever the Lord has, has done in and among us. So I encourage you to be there for that. If you have not decided yet how you are going to participate in that, you still can. You can do that online, graceb3.org, uh, backslash commitment, or you can pick up one of the commitment cards out in the foyer. What are to do with mine? It's somewhere. Here it is. And... Uh, they look like this, and you can place those in one of the boxes here, in the back, or out in the foyer. So that is Momentum. So be here for next week. We'll, we'll see what God has done and see how close we are to that goal. Uh, happy Veterans Day for those of you that are vets. If you're a vet, could you please stand? Oh, come on. I know there's some vets in here. There we go. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your service. Appreciate the sacrifice that you and countless others, men and women, have made in the past and are making in the present for, for, for our freedoms. And we, we just do want to acknowledge and appreciate, appreciate you. The fact, though, that we have veterans, the fact, though, that there is uh, the, the branches of the service that we do, it's necessary to, to be uh, diligent to, to defend our, our nation and, and uh, suppress evil, if you will, is an indication that even though the kingdom of God and the gospel has come among us, it has not been fulfilled ultimately among us. I mean, one of the famous passages in Isaiah says that uh, in the day of, of, of the Prince of Peace, when he is reigning, that all the nations will beat their swords into plowshares. Pretty sure that hasn't happened yet. So there's a lot of work to be done in terms of the advancing of the gospel to, to all nations and even the, the gospel penetrating our own hearts and our own lives to a greater degree. Today marks the 100th year anniversary anniversary of the armistice in World War I. It was November 11th, um, 1918, 11 a.m., was the official moment, so one hour and some from now, uh, was the official moment that the armistice uh, began and the guns fell silent. My son brought this to my attention yesterday. He said there's, a, there's an audio, you can Google it if you, if you, if you just type in um, armistice silence audio, you will see that they, they, uh, they, have, a, uh, they have an audio tract of it's a two-minute audio track that runs from just about a, a minute and a half up to 11 a.m. and then 30 seconds after 11 a.m. And what, here's, what you, here's what you hear. Nothing but shells and explosions literally up until 11 a.m. They bomb the crap out of one another until 11 a.m. And as soon as 11 a.m. hit, you hear nothing. You hear silence. And then you hear birds. It's profound. It's, it's one of the most profound two minutes of audio track you'll ever listen to. In that two minutes, you have what's represented in terms of the fall of man and sin in the world and a brief period of silence and then kind of a glimmer of what the world's supposed to be like. 
But you know what? That silence didn't last for long. Before somebody else pulled a trigger, before some other, other nation invaded another nation. That was a war to end all wars. And it turns out, it didn't end all wars. There was another world war that followed that one. And the world has been in global conflict ever since. Which shouldn't be a surprise. Jesus said that uh, there will be wars and rumors of wars until I return. And we're waiting his return. In the meantime, we are uh, demonstrating and declaring the gospel. Right now we're on Luke chapter 1. If you want to turn there as we continue our Advent series, we're going to take a look at the si role silence plays in our faith. Ironically, we're going to see three things unfold in the text we're going to look at today. We're going to see the promise of the gospel specifically given to Zechariah in, in, in terms of the birth of his eventual son and being the forerunner, John the Baptist, of Jesus. His unbelief, how can that promise actually work out? And then his silence, his silence. We're going to take a look at the promise, unbelief, and silence and how that plays into strengthening our faith that we might walk in faith. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's ask his blessing on our time as we open up the scriptures. Please pray with me and pray for me and also for all of us that we might hear from the Lord. Lord, we thank you for those vets who have served and who are serving. Uh, Lord, they represent a very powerful truth in scripture that greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And we know that there have been many vets who have done just that. They've made the ultimate sacrifice, and we thank you for them. Jesus, we thank you for you in giving the ultimate sacrifice for us. And as we look upon this scripture in Luke, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to see it, understand it, apply it, believe it, that we might be transformed, that you might be glorified. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. So here's where we were at last week. Let's take a look. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife of the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. Just a, a quick context here. Um, there are about 18,000 priests at the time of Zechariah, Levites, that served uh, various duties in the temple as priests. And they would go on rotation. Just like here at Grace Community Church, if you serve in various capacities, more than likely you are on some form of rotation, whether it's children's ministry or on the greeting team or something like that. You're on a week, you're off three, something like that. Now, this is the type of rotation when you draw lots. You were, as a priest, you would probably do this only one time in your entire life. I mean, there's 18,000 of them. And so you were lucky if you were chosen at all ever to serve in the temple and burn incense for the Lord. So what they would do is there was an altar of incense and they would burn incense during that particular day. They would enter the holy place in the temple, the holy place. They would burn these incense and they would intercede as priests and pray on behalf of the nation of Israel. And those incense represented the prayers of the saints going up to God. So there was a lot of symbolism there, but there was a lot of practical prayer. So that's what was going on. And as he was doing that, verse 10, we see that the whole multitude of the people were outside, outside, and they were praying for him and also for the nation as well. So there was a whole lot of prayer going on at this point. So that's the context. Let's keep reading. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him. Makes sense. That's not something you expect when you're serving in the temple is the appearance of, of the angel Gabriel. And fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear a son and you shall call his name John and you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great before the Lord. Okay, we'll just stop right here. So the angel tells him what? Your prayers have been answered. That begs the question, what was Zechariah praying? 
Now, what we don't know is which prayers the angel is referring to. Is he referring to the prayers that he was offering as he was serving as high priest, uh, or not high priest, as the priest in the temple at that moment, those prayers as he was offering incense? Or is he referring to the prayers that he has prayed throughout his married life regarding the fact that they don't have a child? We're not told. We're not told. Uh, but the, 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 the truth of the matter is he answers both of those prayers. God, not the angel. God answers both of those prayers. He answers the prayer for a son, for a child, because they were unable to have children. Even though it's very, very doubtful that at that moment, at that moment, as Zechariah was praying and he was offering incense, it's highly unlikely that he was thinking consciously, Lord, Je Lord not Jesus, Jesus hasn't been born yet. Yahweh, God, Jehovah, Lord God, Jehovah, please give us a son. It's highly unlikely that the priest was doing that because his role at that moment was to intercede for the nation. And as priest, he was the interceder. He was the go-between between between the nation and God. And he was interceding. He was practically praying for the nation. Now, of course, he'd been praying for his wife. But I, I do believe, I can't help but think that at that moment, he was not praying for a child. Why? Because if you look ahead in verse 20, if you have your Bibles open, the angel tells him, uh, rebukes him for his unbelief. He's long past hoping that there's ever going to be a child. So, but here's the cool thing. Here's what God does. God takes this guy's personal life and his longings and his wants and his desires and weds it, his desires, with God's desires, not only for this man and his family, but for the nation and the hope of Israel. So God's prayers in advancing his kingdom have immense practical value in terms of our own very lives and, our, and the intertwining of our lives and his plan. And we're going to see that unfold. So let's take a look, at, uh, let's take a look at, at what else the angel said about that. Regarding this son that would be born, he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and to the disobedient, to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. The angel essentially tells Zechariah, that his son to be born will fulfill a number of Old Testament prophecies. And he lists them. He doesn't list them, but he quotes those prophecies right here in Luke chapter 1. One of those being Malachi, the very last book in the Old Testament, the prophet Malachi, in chapter 3, verse 1. God says to Malachi, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to the temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And then in the last two verses of the Old Testament, this prophecy is given to Malachi. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes and he will turn hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Also in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, Isaiah says that, uh, Behold, uh, one in the wilderness, making, decrying out, make ready for the way of the Lord, and he will uh, and, and, and prepare the path of the coming of the Lord. So uh, the angel here is telling um, Zechariah that your son, he is going to be that person who is the forerunner of the Messiah, who will be a salvation and good news for all, all men. So that's the prophecy. That's the prophecy. And he's saying it's going to be fulfilled, and your son is going to bring that about. Now let's take a look at the response. Verse 18, Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel, and I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my word, which will be fulfilled in their time. So, how does Zechariah respond to this promise? 
with unbelief and doubt. He's not a whole lot different than any one of us. He's not a whole lot different than any one of us. Now, there's two types of unbelief. There's, and we want to be clear on what, what we mean when we're talking about unbelief. Because it's clear he says you didn't believe. There's two types of unbelief. There's the unbelief of the scoffer. The unbelief of the scoffer. The scoffer hears the promises of God, looks at the scriptures and says, there is no God. This, you find if you want to believe in the sky fairy, but there is no real God. It's just us. I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe that Jesus is the son of God. I don't believe any of that nonsense. And it's all just a bunch of malarkey. Okay, that's a scoffer. That's a scoffer. Zechariah is not a scoffer. He's a believer in the sense that he believes in, he believes in the God of Israel. He believes that the scriptures are, are, are real. He believes they're true. He believes that Moses, God used Moses and part of the Red Sea. He believed that, that, uh, that Abraham and Sarah were unable to conceive and then God uh, opened up her womb and she conceived. He believes all of that, just not for him. Do you see the difference? Okay, the scoffer does not believe in the existence of God or the fact there is a God. This person believes in the historical truths of the Bible. They just don't see how it's actually going to work out for them. They don't see how it's going to work out for them. Israel, if you look at verse 16 and 17 here, if we back it up, they have a long history of unbelief. Verse 16, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. Now, what does that imply? If you turn the children of Israel to the Lord their God, where were the children of Israel facing before they turned to the Lord their God? Away from God. And yet, they're not unbelievers in the scoffer sense. I believe that what we're looking at here in this text is also very prevalent in the church in our day and age. And that is that most people here, you're not full-blown atheists. Some of you might be. And if you are, you're welcome here. It's a good place to bring your questions, bring your skepticism, and understand that uh, we value uh, the fact that not everybody, believe, everybody believes the Bible, and, and this is a safe place to, to wrestle through your problems. But most of you don't fit that category. And yet many of you, although you are intellectually sure that the Bible is true, that Jesus died on the cross for sins, that he was buried, he rose on the third day, and he sent the Holy Spirit, and yet, practically, many of you live as if you are unbelievers. In other words, you don't believe the truths and the promise which, is, which are given to you actually technically apply to you. Let me, let, me, let me bear this out just a little bit more. So what is, what is Zachariah's problem? Let's take a look. What's his hang up here? What's the text? Oops, let me advance it. What's, what's he say? Okay. How, how will I know this? Why? Why is he struggling with doubt? What's the reason? It's right there in the text. Because he's old, his wife is advanced in years. In other words, it's been decades. They've been praying this prayer for decades, and they eventually stopped. Because, you know, God, yeah, he opened up Sarah's womb. Yay, he did that. He's done that lots of times in the Old Testament, but he hasn't done it for us. You ever been there? You read the promises of scripture and you say, well, that, that's great that God answered those people's prayers, but he hasn't mine. Mm -hmm. So when, when people struggle with various types of barrenness, various types of barrenness, they can slip into a cynicism and, also, and almost a practical atheism. I didn't, not full-blown scoffing unbelief, but the, the unbelief of a believer, if, if I can say that. The unbelief of a believer. Somebody who believes the scriptures are true, they just don't think it's going to work out in their case. There's physical barrenness. I mean, we have a prime example here of a, of a couple who is infertile and they're just unable to have children. And many of you, uh, some of you, you're, you literally, that is your issue. Married couples, they get married and they, they, they look forward to the idea of having children and they're just unable to. And every time one of their friends announces that, oh, I'm pregnant, come to the baby shower, it's just kind of like a little dagger in the heart. Dagger in the heart. Mother's Day comes along, dagger in the heart. And, and you pray and you pray and God doesn't answer your prayer. And so you wonder why. Why is it me? Do I lack faith? 
Am I broken? And regardless, you feel physically barren and God is silent. He's not answered your prayers. For some of you, it's not infertility. Some of you, it's just chronic pain, chronic illness. You don't know why you're sick and you all go to the doctor and, and the doctor can't figure it out and you just, you just one more week, one more month, one more year of pain. One more year of uncertainty. Some of you, you do have a diagnosis, but it doesn't change the fact that your, your pain is chronic and, and your suffering is chronic and it just doesn't seem to go away. And you pray and you ask others to pray and then you keep praying and eventually you don't hear from God. You don't hear, yes, I'll heal you. But here's what you do hear. You do hear the questions of people asking you again and again and again, how are you feeling? And you get sick of telling them nothing's changed. And you slip in type of, type of a subtle cynicism that maybe God doesn't really answer your prayers like he does everybody else's. And I've slipped into that place at times over the last 20 years. And you, it's not that you don't believe that God can and does heal. You just don't believe he'll do it for you. And you struggle. And you waver with this kind of cynicism. For some of you, it's not a physical barrenness. It's a relational barrenness. Your health is great. You're just in a, you're just in a marriage you wish you weren't in. You've been married for 20, 30, 10 years. And there's just relational barrenness. There's just hostility. There's just bitterness. And you've prayed. You've asked God, would you change my husband? You've asked God, would you change my wife? You've asked God, would you change me? And you hear nothing. You have parents here who, whose children have, have, have rebelled and they've gone away from the Lord and, and their heart just aches and they pray for their children and they... They, and they hear, they hear about the prodigal and they hear about other people's kids who come back to the Lord and, and they have a hard time rejoicing because they've prayed and they haven't seen God answer in their, their case. They've seen marriages restored. They've watched the stupid momentum videos of the couple who, who said God changed our marriage and they're saying, well, he hasn't changed mine. All you hear is silence. And some of you, it's not a relationship. It's, it's not even a physical issue. It's your own sin issue. And you've asked God to change you and you keep falling into the cycle of temptation, sin, shame, guilt, resolution. I'm going to change temptation, sin, and that cycle of addiction and cycle of disobedience. And finally, you just grow to the place where you think God's never going to change me and I'm beyond hope. Some of you, you don't have physical illnesses, you don't have relational problems, you don't have personal sin issues which are self-destructive in the sense that they destroy your life and your relationships. Some of you are just bored. You don't see God working in or around you. You're just pursuing the American dream of more stuff. And you're bored. And you read the New Testament, you read the Old Testament, you say, I don't see that God in our, in our universe. I, it's not that I don't believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, but I don't feel him. You identify with the preacher in, in the book of Ecclesiastes who says, you know, I see all this stuff and it's utter vanity. And I don't even see the point. Anybody depressed yet? Or do I need to keep going? <laughs> That's where Zachariah is at. He's not a scoffer. He's just a hurting old man that hasn't seen his prayers answer. There's a lot of hurting people in this room right now that are waiting on God, but they hear nothing. And you're, you're, you're not different than this guy. That's a normal place to be as a follower of, 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 of Christ. 
but don't stay there. The irony is that when God is silent, how do you break through? Let's take a look at what the angel says. <laughs> oh, that's irony. The angel answered him, I'm Gabriel, stand in the pres I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and bring you good news. And behold, <laughs> you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which we fulfilled in their time. Here's the irony. Zachariah has experienced the silence of God all these years, and he's, and he's just kind of in a barren place. So he doubts that, that God's actually going to do what God's going to do. And so what's the solution? Shut up. Be quiet. You're struggling with doubt right now. You're doing this. What you need to do is this. Be silent. You will be unable to speak until God has fulfilled all of these things. And honestly, I, I read this and I see myself in this, this passage. I make my living running my mouth and telling people what the Bible says. There's nothing wrong with me doing what I do. I enjoy doing what I do. But oftentimes when I find myself in this place of cynicism, knowing better and still being in the place of cynicism, I need to shut my mouth and I need to behold and look at what God is doing. There's a precedent for this whole be quiet thing. <laughs> this is not the first time this has happened. In our silence plays a role in the strengthening of our faith, ironically. Turning your Bibles to Genesis chapter 15. This is not the first old barren couple in the Bible. The first old barren couple in the Bible is, is Abraham and Sarah. And God comes to Abraham in Genesis 12 and says, Follow me, you and your wife, and I will, I will give you the land that I will show you, and I will bless all nations through your offspring. And he's like, offspring? I don't have kids. This is about, he's about 70 years old at the time. I don't have kids. He goes, I will bless all nations through your offspring. And he gives the promise. And then later, uh, he tries to make that happen on his own with, uh, with his wife's servant, Hagar. Bad idea. And in Genesis chapter 15, God comes to him again in the 15th chapter of Genesis and, and says, I want you to look up into the stars. Count them if you can. You won't be able to, but count them if you can. He goes, your, your descendants will be more numerous than all the stars that you can't count because there's too many to count. Again, look at verse 18. Or 18, I'm sorry, verse 8. But he said, O oh Lord, how am I to know that I shall possess it? That's not different than Zechariah. God says, here's my promise to you. And he's like, How? We've already had this conversation. You do know that I'm married to a woman who's about 75, 80 years old and we couldn't have kids when she was hot and young and now she's old and not hot. I still don't understand how we're going to do this. It didn't work back in the day when the plumbing worked and I don't know how it's going to work now. So that's what he's asking. How? And here's what God says to him. Oh, man, the scriptures are awesome. <laughs> Bring me a heifer, a goat, some other livestock. Well, that, that answers everything. <laughs> now I get it. And he, and he says, the thing gets even weirder. Okay, now cut all those animals in half. Okay, now line them up in two rows. Done. And then it says, God caused Abraham to fall into a deep sleep. Now, he wasn't sleeping as in getting REM sleep, but caused him to fall into a deep sleep, and yet Abraham is able to see everything that happens. In other words, God struck him dumb. He was not able to move, nor was he able to speak. He could only watch. And here's what he watched. Let me give you a little context. The whole cutting up of animals is not unusual at Abraham's time. It's how...
Kings made covenants with one another. So if two warring tribes were to make peace and they were to enter into a covenant, they would cut a covenant. By cutting a covenant, they would take animals, a heifer, a goat, livestock, they would cut these animals in pieces and they would distribute the pieces on two rows, one here and one here. And then the kings would come together and they would, they would link arms and they would walk through the dead animals which they had cut in two and separated. And what that meant was, may the person who violates this covenant, may it be done unto them as been done unto these animals. You starting to get the picture here? And yet, Abraham is struck dumb, silent, and he doesn't walk through the pieces of the, cov the, pieces of the, of the, of the, of the carcass. Instead, he sees a manifestation in the presence of the glory of God who goes through the pieces alone. It's a one-sided covenant. So what's Abraham's part in this one-sided covenant? Shut up and watch. You be quiet and you watch God do what God's going to do. And it's weird because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense at the time. There's no way Abraham understands the significance of what he's just seen or heard. until you get to 2,000 years later. Another miraculous child, this time not Isaac, nor John the Baptist, but another miraculous child by the name of Jesus. He's silent. But his silence different than Abraham's. And his silence also different than Zacharias. His silence is wholly voluntarily. It's, it's, it's his volitional choice. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. He is before his accusers and he fulfills Isaiah 53, verse 7, which says, as a lamb goes before his shears, so the suffering servant will be silent. He could speak, he could defend himself, but he chooses to be silent. And, and the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all record the fact that he's silent before his accusers. And then there's the silence of the Father. Jesus doesn't remain silent. He eventually answers his accusers when they say, tell us the truth plainly. Are you the Messiah? He says, yes, it is as you say. And you will see the Son of Man ascending into the clouds of heaven and seating at the right hand of the Father. And they rip their garments and say, we've heard enough. Crucify him. He's not silent from the cross either. He says that he's thirsty. He tells John to take care of his mom. And then in Matthew 27, verse 47, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you know what he heard? Nothing. Because the Father chose to be silent. Do you know why? Because the covenant that was made with Abraham 2,000 years earlier was being ratified right at that moment. As Jesus was being torn And I've got to ask you the question, who broke the covenant? Who broke the covenant? We broke the covenant. And he's the one who bears our sin. And the father forsakes his own son and turns his head away and his wrath remains on his own son. And what God is telling Zacharias is you just need to be quiet. Stop talking. And just watch me work. 
watch me work. I think too often times in our own barrenness, we are, and it's by the way, there's nothing wrong with, with being in pain. It's part of the human condition. There's nothing wrong with crying out to the Lord. Oh, how long, oh Lord? I mean, the psalmist did it, Psalm 13. We see that over and over again. But here's the thing. God comes to us and he says, I got this. I'm not promising you that you're going to have a life without suffering, but I am promising that I love you and I'm asking you to trust me here. And we retort just like Zachariah. Well, I don't understand how. Blah, 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 blah. Watch. Just watch. Just stop talking. Just watch me. And we have, we have the precedent in Scripture that when we stop speaking and we watch God work and see how, how He has worked, that's where the renewing and the strengthening of our faith comes. Let's take a look at the rest of the story here. The people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he'd seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them, but he remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went home. And after, the days, after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, thus the Lord has done for me the days when he looked upon me to take away my reproach among the people. Okay, I hope I don't need to explain this. But Zechariah, although silent, was not passive. How do we know he was not passive? His wife's pregnant now. He went home and he was obedient. He went home and he was obedient. He said, the Lord promised me, and I'm pretty sure that it still works the same way it's always worked. We're going to have to do something tonight, Elizabeth, if this is actually going to happen. Although he might be writing that on a tablet because he's... Or making signs, I don't know. <laughs> but the point is, as he's silently watching God work, he's also trusting God and taking the next step. What is your next step? I don't know where you're at. Some of you, the next step is you need to take the first step. And that first step is to trust Jesus for the salvation of your sins. You need to cry out to the Lord. The scriptures say, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. He says, tell him what he already knows. Jesus, I'm a sinner and I'm in need of a savior. He says, all who call on me will be saved. Take my yoke upon you. It is easy and light. Yet to all who call on him, to those who received his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. That's your first step, is to believe. For some of you, that's, that's not an issue. You're already there. You're a child of God, and you know you're a child of God, but you're barren. You're hurting. You're in rebellion. You're doubtful. And God's saying, just trust me. I don't know how. That's unique to each one of you. But what is that step of faith? Is that step of faith being baptized? Is that step of faith getting into biblical community? Is that step of faith reconciling with someone who's very difficult to reconcile with? Is that step of faith forgiving someone? Is that step of faith uh, forsaking sin? There's a, there's a million applications. But each one of them start with not looking inward to see, am I young? Am I virile? Is my wife hot and fertile? No, that's not, that's not how we, that's not what the angel says. No, the angel says, be quiet now and watch God work. Take your eyes off of yourself and put them on the God who spoke the universe into existence and put them on the God who separated the Red Sea and caused a whole nation to walk through it and put them on a God who created a human being in a virgin's womb, who lived a sinless, perfect life and is the very embodiment of the incarnate God who took your sins to the cross, died and, was ro and rose again, and has given us the Holy Spirit. Keep them on that God. 
And remember that you have the cross as a witness that God's solution to barrenness isn't to avoid suffering, but to go through it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the gospel and the freeness of it, that you give it to guys like like Zachariah, that you give it to guys like Abraham, that you give it to guys like me and gals like the woman at the well and ladies like the woman caught in adultery, people that are barren. Lord, thank you that we don't need to come to you bearing fruit to receive you, but we come to you with nothing and receive everything. Thank you for the freeness of your grace. May it do a wonder and a work in our hearts this Christmas season. Amen.